from the WKYT studios in Lexington, this is Kentucky Newsmakers with Bill Bryant. Good morning from WKYT News. I'm Bill Bryant, hoping you're enjoying this nice weekend. Later, the future of Rupp Arena. $15 million worth of upgrades are on the way to the home of the Wildcats, but it's not the massive overhaul that was proposed by Mayor Jim Gray. We'll hear from Lexington Center's Bill Owen a little later. But first on Kentucky Newsmakers, the Fancy Farm political picnic in western Kentucky this weekend signaled the unofficial start of the general election campaign in the Commonwealth. And a new WKYT Herald Leader Bluegrass Poll shows the statewide candidates have every reason to keep working hard as we head toward November. In that poll, in the governor's race, Democrat Jack Conway has a slight lead over Republican Matt Bevan, but it is a fierce fight region by region. And if he were eligible for a third term, it looks like Governor Steve Bashir would likely be in a strong position given that he enjoys majority approval four months before the state constitution requires him to leave office. Lexington Herald Leader Political Political writer Sam Youngman has been out on the campaign trail and talks with the candidates regularly, and he's joining us now to take a look at the numbers. Good to see you. It's great to be with you. Let's get right to the governor's race. Democrat Jack Conway with this early lead, 45% to Republican Matt Bevins, 42%. That is inside the uh, uh, margin of error, which is 3.8%. And it looks like, Sam, it is a battle region by region. Yeah, there's no question. It's what we've come to see over the years. Right now, Jack Conway is, is narrowly ahead in this race. Now, it's a statistical tie, but he's hanging in there in large part because he's got a 30 plus point lead in the Louisville, Jefferson County area. And I remember Matt Bevins from Jefferson County, too. So that's it's, you know, it's prime real estate when it comes to this kind of race. I think the, one of the bigger surprises for me in this poll is that Matt Bevin has only got a two-point lead in the Northern Kentucky region. Now, Northern Kentucky, it's a bastion of Tea Party activists. It's really, I think, I've always thought of it as Matt Bevin's home base. He needs to do better there. He overperformed there in the primary, in the Republican primary. It's what put him over the top, number 83 votes over James Comer, so every vote mattered. But I expect him to do better in Northern Kentucky than he is right now. The really good news for Jack Conway is that he's neck and neck right now in Eastern Kentucky, so all the efforts he's making to present himself as a coal friendly Democrat, at least right now, and keep in mind we're just uh, just under 100 days to go, at least right now Jack Conway's efforts seem to be paying off. And you mentioned uh, uh, Bevan uh, perhaps uh, slightly underperforming in uh, socially conservative northern Kentucky and in an interesting summer in which there has been a lot of uh, uh, cultural upheaval in this country, right. controversial issues that have been out there, and uh, Jack Conway has had uh, to wear some of that in this campaign. Well, I think overall the takeaway from this poll is it's good news for Jack Conway. He obviously had a very high profile role in the gay marriage debate. Uh, you know, I think going forward, it could continue to be a problem for him. If you, you know, if you, if you look at the attitude, it, you know, Kentucky is just not where the rest of the country is on this issue. I think it could still be a problem for him. But right now, a summer of major social social change, as you said, and a subsequent you know, conservative backlash, which I think was to be expected, and Jack Conway's still right here in this thing. So I think he's got to look at this and either breathe, breathe a sigh of relief, if not just you know, start dancing on the table. And you have made a point that if these uh, issues continue to be on the table, when we get to October, right. or in those weeks going into the campaign, that would spell trouble for Jack Conway. Well, oh, I think it could. I think it could be the kind of thing, I, I tell you, I think we could be sitting here in December looking back and saying, well, God, Gosh, it was just so easy to see. You know, it was a perfect storm. You had all this social change happening in such a short window of time. It was just, it created a perfect storm that just, you know, enveloped the Democratic Party. Uh, but right now, at least, you know, right now, and I keep stressing, we're just, we're less than 100 days out, and I don't know really, you know, how many people are paying attention yet. But right now, it seems like Jack Conway has weathered that storm. You have talked to Conway recently. A lot of people have criticized him for not being as present on the campaign trail as, uh, as he might have been, that he might have been more visible during these uh, weeks of summer. Uh, why is that? Well, I, if I can just be quite blunt about it, it's because Kentucky has a $1,000 contribution limit to its uh, statewide candidates. You know, the truth of the matter is Jack Conway has to raise money, and he has to raise a lot of it. You know, Matt Bevin has got deep pockets of his own. He's, he's self-funded the majority of his Senate and gubernatorial campaigns, and you never know when an opponent like that can just sit down and write a big check. Jack's going to have to have the money to push back, and I think right now he's burning up the fundraising circuit to make that happen. And Bevin 
Evanese uh, out there, uh, maybe more visible? Well, I, I would say somewhat more visible. He's, uh, you know, he's sort of checking the boxes. I think, you know, what's interesting is that their running mates are both out there. They're, they seem to be hitting the campaign trail harder than anybody. You know, I'm still hearing from a lot of Republicans who are wondering where is Matt Bevent. They haven't seen him. They haven't heard from him. You're hearing this from a lot of county chairs, especially, and I think you, that's reflected somewhat in this poll. Um, you know, when you look at, at that the cross tabs, you look, drive down, drill down into the numbers, you see that Matt Bevin is losing 15% of voters who self identify as very conservative. Now, it's hard for me to imagine that 15% of very conservative voters are going to pull the lever for Jack Conway, but right now he's winning them over. If you're one of these candidates, do you work harder in areas where you are ahead and try to maintain that, or do you work harder in areas where you're behind? It's got to be both. You know, I, I think, especially in a race like this, when it is a toss up, when it is going to be I think low turnout because I think it's going to be a very nasty race. It's going to be a scorch the earth race. I think that's going to turn off a lot of people. So you've really got to, I think, you know, this is where the challenge is for Democrats because I think you have to turn out your base. And that's true for both candidates. But it's a, I think it's trickier for a Democrat in Kentucky right now to try and turn out the base because, you know, your base wants to hear where you are in gay marriage. They want it to be the right place on gay marriage. But conservative Democrats, on the other hand, might disagree with that. And so it's, I think it's a, an incredibly tricky balancing act for any Democrat running statewide. In Kentucky. All right, independent uh, Drew Curtis now indicates that he has the signatures to get on the ballot, and uh, he says he's going to continue to collect them until uh, August 11th, which is the filing deadline for independence. The polls show he has an interesting effect on this race. Yeah, it's funny. I hear from so many liberal Democrats that they're concerned that Drew will get in and play the role of spoiler. But what we see from this poll is he's actually pulling from both sides. If you put Drew Curtis in the mix, 43, 38, 8 percent. You know, I think a lot of Democrats' worst nightmare is that Drew Curtis gets in the race and plays sort of a Ralph Nader role, playing a spoiler and swinging the election to, uh, to Matt Bevin. And yet in this case, apparently he pulls just a little bit more from Bevin than he does from Conway. I know. It's, it's, it's very surprising. It makes me, honestly, right now at this point, I think it registered as, registers as almost a, a protest vote among respondents who just didn't know enough about the candidates to say. Now, having said that, Drew Curtis is right. This is not the only poll that is showing him pulling from both sides. And I asked him about that this week, you know, this idea that he might play a spoiler. And he said, hey, they're not his votes. I'm not stealing any votes because they don't belong to him. Right. Well, and he strongly says that he uh, has no idea where his uh, votes would come from. He, no, he I says think he, his, he just puts his ideas out there and he doesn't know which way they lean. Yeah, he's, <laughs> he's, he's new to this, but he's, he said he's having a good time. If he does take uh, eight or ten or more votes uh, out of the electorate, though, uh, could he truly be a spoiler in this election? Oh, I think so. Anytime you're talking about a race that's going to be this close, and especially, you know, you look at the environment Jack Conway and Democrats are running against right now. The president continues to be very unpopular in the state of Kentucky. You add in the, the summer of social change that we talked about, and I, you know, I think there, there are significant headwinds running against Democrats. If you throw in any kind of you know, monkey wrench into that, you know, basically what I would say is there's no margin for error, and Drew Curtis represents a threat to that, I think. Sam, you've been covering this race uh, out there and going to a lot of these forums and events, and uh, it, when Conway and Bevan are face-to-face, -face, uh, uh, <laughs> they don't get along very well out there, do they? Do they uh, play well? It's the old cliche. There is no love lost between these two contenders. No, they really don't. It's, um, they, they drip with contempt for one another. You know, at, at a forum just this past week in Louisville, um, I mean, they were trading shots of everything from where they were born to where they went to college. Um, you know, at, at one point, Matt Bevin brought up the fact that Jack Conway went to Duke, which I, you know, I, I would point out to Matt Bevin that the man he's supporting for president also went to Duke. But, uh, but you know, Jack Conway shoots back, well, at least I didn't lie about where I went to college. Of course, referencing Matt Bevin, including MIT on his LinkedIn account. So, no, I, it's like I said, this is going to be a scorch the earth campaign. <laughs> the only prediction I've been willing to make, and this is a little bit tongue in cheek, is that we're going to be looking at record low turnout. Well, uh, because it sounds like both sides are going to turn off some voters, you know? I think so. Yeah. I mean, you know, and you understand where Jack Conway's coming from here. If this, if this race turns into yet another referendum on President Barack Obama, then Jack Conway is toast. But if he can make this a choice election between Jack Conway and Matt Bevin, then I think he's got a fighting chance. It sounded like one thing they agreed on before the uh, State Chamber of Commerce uh, this week was uh, potentially privatizing some of the state park system. Yeah, that was one of the... <laughs> 
that was one of the more bizarre uh, bizarre exchanges I'd seen. You know, here it looked like Matt Bevin had sort of made a, a, what looked like a gap, saying, you know, I want to privatize the state parks, and then Jack Conway hurried to agree with him. Uh, you know, I, I think it was maybe a question they weren't exactly prepared for. Now, Matt Bevin has said in his blueprint for Kentucky that he wants to sell off some of the state's assets, you know, to, because the state needs money. What he hasn't done is say with any specificity whatsoever what those assets would be. And we've asked repeatedly, you know, what are you thinking? What are you thinking about selling that belongs to the state of Kentucky right now? And he, uh, he just has so far stiff-armed us on that one. How much of a factor uh, could Governor Steve Beshear be uh, in this race? The poll shows he has majority approval. We'll take a look at that number uh, right now, uh, which is enviable for a, a two-term governor in the twilight of his administration. Is this election to any extent uh, a referendum on Steve Beshear? Well, I think Democrats would like for it to be. You know, the governor has run a, a less scandal-free administration. He continues to have, I mean, 51% after eight years in office. That's remarkable, especially when you consider this state's feelings toward the pre towards the president, the president's health care law, and Governor Bashir's implementation of that. I mean, gosh, Governor Bashir was at the State of the Union as a guest of the president. I mean, that's, you know, that's the kind of thing that you would just think would cause him problems in Kentucky. But so far, it hasn't. I mean, more than half of voters and more than half of respondents like the job he's doing. Only 33% disapprove. The question I have is, is he is he he's popular, but is he popular with coattails? Does he do it not? Does he is he popular enough that it helps Jack Conway, or that it in some way negates the uh, the antipathy a lot of voters in Kentucky feel towards President Obama? And then of course the other big question is, does the last name help his son become the next Attorney General? Andy Bashir in the Attorney General's race, which was the first uh, statewide race that uh, Steve Bashir held in 1979. How much of a focus is the governor? putting on his son's election? Oh, I think quite a bit. I mean, as much as anything he's done in office, I think his son's election would be a, a critical part of his uh, of his legacy. And, I, you know, I think you're starting to see that race heat up just as much as the governor's race, if not more so. And uh, we're looking at that number now with uh, Bashir with a, a seven-point lead or so over Whitney Westerfield in another race that could get uh, interesting as the weeks roll along. Well, and Andy Bashir has a massive financial advantage over Whitney Westerfield. After the last report, Westerfield had about eight thousand dollars in the bank. Andy Bashir had well over a million dollars. So I mean, there's a lot of disparity there. But again, I don't think you know, look financial advantages, the best team. These are all things that you could just almost throw out the window in October if the environment remains as poisonous as it is right now for Democrats. Adam Edlin has uh, often been uh, called a rising star in the Democratic Party, and uh, many say that he may end up in the U.S. Senate race next mm -hmm. year uh, against Rand Paul, or uh, however that all unfolds. Uh, in in this uh, poll, the Bluegrass poll by WKYT and the Herald Leader, though, uh, a somewhat close race there with uh, uh, the Republican Harmon, who's a state representative from uh, uh, Central Kentucky. Yeah, I think you're seeing a couple things at play in this race right now. For one, Adam has never had the name ID that he would like to. He's not as well known around Kentucky. He doesn't have that built-in reservoir uh, of being of being a known commodity. Uh, so I think that hurts him a little bit. And then you add in the environment. Uh, you know, I think this, if anything. Thing. This sort of bears out Adam's decision to, you know, keep stiff arming us on talking about the Senate race. He keeps saying repeatedly, "Look, I've got a race right now. I'm running for re-election." He's smart not to take his eye off the ball here because clearly it's a, it's a real race. And that's a race for state auditor, by the yes. way, for his uh, re-election there. All right, Republicans uh, seem to have uh, one advantage in one statewide race, and that is in the agriculture commissioner's race. Uh, they've held it the last 12 years, and here you have uh, the GOP nominee Ryan Quarles uh, leading in that race. Yeah, Ryan Quarles is. Really well liked within the Republican Party. He's he's viewed as a rising star, like you said about Adam. He's he's viewed as somebody who's got the the exact right resume to win this race. Uh, frankly, I was a little surprised it's as close as it is right now. It tells me more than anything. Uh, you can almost take the names out of the poll and just you know do a generic ballot Republican versus Democrat. And I think that was true of a lot of these down ballot races. Is that voters just haven't tuned in yet? You know, we're just getting past Fancy Farm. You know, I think that Senate race last year. It left a bad taste in a lot of people's mouths, myself included. So I think, you know, we're getting ready to turn that corner where voters start tuning in, and we'll maybe start to see one or two of these candidates pull away. We also uh, polled some issues. We've uh, talked about uh, the results of the uh, how Kentuckians feel about the Supreme Court uh, ruling on gay marriage and county clerks who uh, declined to issue marriage licenses. We'll be having that uh, tomorrow uh, in the publication and uh, online and on air. Sam, as we uh, now move beyond Fancy Farm and into the general election, uh, cycle 
now. Um, what will you be watching for the next few weeks? You know, the two things I'm going to continue to look for are how did they consolidate their own party support? You know, Matt Bevin has, has he's, he's made a lot of headway from where he was. You know, when we polled this race with a hypothetical, what if it's Matt Bevin versus Jack Conway in May, right before the primary, it was 43 Conway, 38 Bevin. Oh, I'm sorry. No, it was uh, got it right here. Yep, 48, 43, 38. Now, Matt Bevin has done a lot of consolidation of support just by virtue of being a Republican who got the nomination. But again, I mentioned the 15% very conservative right now who are voting for Conway, or that they're neck and neck right now in eastern Kentucky. I think Matt Bevin has still got a lot of work to do to consolidate his support within the Republican Party. I think for a lot of Republicans, especially those who are loyal to Senator Mitch McConnell, you know, the way Matt Bevin acted after last year's primary has you know, rubbed them the wrong way and they're not over it yet. He's got to, he's got to get them together and he's got to get them turned out. Same is true of Jack Conway. You know, right now, Jack Conway is losing 20% of Democratic support, which sounds awful, but it's not as bad as it could be. You know, what we've seen in the last few election cycles are Democratic candidates running statewide losing 25 to 30% of Democrats. So I think, you know, what I'm looking for going forward is not how are they doing with independent voters, not how are they doing with swing voters, how are they doing with their own parties? Mm -hmm. So consolidate their support and then try to and turn them out. That. And yeah. turn them All out. Right. Sam, thank you so much. Great to Always be with you. fun. All right, we'll have uh, more polling results along the way. And we hope you'll stay with us us on WKYT. Coming next, Bill Owen, who runs Lexington Center, will be talking about the expansion plans at Rupp Arena here on Kentucky Newsmakers. Welcome back to WKYT's Kentucky Newsmakers. Changes are coming to Rupp Arena. It will be more tech savvy in the future. Lexington Center's board has approved $15 million worth of upgrades for the 40-year-old facility that is the home of the Kentucky Wildcats. It's not the major overhaul that Mayor Jim Gray had pushed for before uh, when he got that pushback and eventually decided to put it all on hold, but it will be some major improvements. Bill Owen is president of Lexington Center, which manages Rupp Arena as well as the Convention Center, the Lexington Opera House, Triangle Park, lots of responsibilities. Bill, thanks for coming in. Uh, this comes on the weekend after uh, a revenue record was set uh, for Rupp Arena. I find that to be interesting. The Eagles were a hit in town. Saturday night, the Eagles did almost 17,000, and it did break a record for uh, ticket sales revenue in the history of Rupp Arena over the last almost 40 years. Uh, I, I believe on the Eagles tour it was eclipsed only by Madison Square Garden. Now, of course, I think the tour still has some locations to run, but it was a big weekend. Well, it's a pretty good thing to get out there and uh, sell when you're talking to other acts about coming to Ab town, right? Absolutely. It just establishes our market as being able to uh, support the, the, the mega show. Well, what does uh, $15 million uh, buy for Rupp Arena? This is pretty comprehensive. We began about three years ago looking at our video system primarily, which was first installed in 2000, 15 years ago. And it is an, an old technology. It, it uh, broadcasts in a 4 by 3 aspect ratio instead of a 16 by 9. It is not HD. It's an analog signal. And it was equipment that had a lifespan life cycle of about 10 to 11 years and is coming up on 15 years old. Uh, so we launched uh, the first leg of it is to replace our production studio uh, to go to a, a, a 16 by 9 uh, high definition uh, compliant digital signal. Uh, we will issue an invitation to bid this week for uh, replacement of the corner screens that are 12 feet tall and 20 feet wide. The new ones will be installed uh, 14 feet tall and 25 feet wide. They'll be again high resolution and a 16 by 9 aspect ratio. Now the production time of those screens uh, is 12 to 14 weeks, so fans are going to see them replaced as they're going one at a time as they're going to ball games mm -hmm. in December. Uh, that's the first step. The second step next summer will be extending our production rigging grid uh, in the Rupp Arena ceiling to make it um, easier, safer, faster, and cheaper to install these mega production um, um, concert and family show uh, productions that do come into Rupp Arena and are very heavy. Um, the one that's on screen is uh, Marvel Universe, uh, which weighs about 150,000 pounds and covers uh, much uh, farther down stage than the rigging grid that was installed in 1976. Uh, so that's the first step next summer and we'll also equip uh, that configuration to support a center-hung uh, uh, 
uh, scoreboard, video, and sound system array. So these acts require a lot more uh, equipment than they did in 1976. 1976, <laughs> you had Elvis Presley with his guitar and Conway Twitty with his guitar, and you had about maybe 25, 30,000 pounds of equipment hanging from the ceiling. Uh, the really big, uh, heavy show a few years ago was Tim McGraw and Faith Hill that was 137,000 pounds and kind of took the industry uh, by shock at how much equipment there was. Buildings could not play the show because of the weight. Now they're getting to that and more. There's a show out, uh, uh, tour out this year that weighs 170,000 pounds. So just being able to accommodate those mega shows and keeping Rupp Arena competitive in that environment is very important. All right, let's talk about uh, Rupp as the home of the Kentucky Wildcats. I think we have another image that we'll show in just a moment, and, and that is uh, what it's likely to look like in there uh, during a game once all of the changes are completed. Well, for the upcoming season, we're going to have uh, the ribbon fascia, uh, LED ribbon fascia, where you see the Welcome to Rupp Arena. Uh, and that's going to be an electronic light emitting diode or LED uh, device that will be up and going for the upcoming season, indeed by uh, a Big Blue Madness. And then uh, for the 2016-17 season, we expect to have the center hung scoreboard array installed. Uh, but again, for the upcoming season, midways through, the corner screens will be a big enhancement and improvement as well. And then the last piece will be uh, to, to make Rupp Arena uh, state-of-the-art from a Wi-Fi connectivity uh, aspect. So your smartphone will work, you'll be able to text and tweet and upload and download and do all of those things that, uh, that we demand to do with, <laughs> with our, our uh, screen device. Fans expect that these days, don't we've, they? We've become a society that lives life looking at a screen. All right. We're going to come back in just a moment. I'm going to ask Bill Owen this question. Is this just the beginning of a phase of projects that could uh, upgrade Rupp Arena? We're back on WKYT's Kentucky Newsmakers in a moment. Welcome back in to WKYT's Kentucky Newsmakers. The president of Lexington Center is with us, Bill Owen, and we're learning about these changes coming to Rupp Arena. Uh, Bill, we all know there was this major proposal from Mayor Jim Gray uh, last year uh, that would have represented a much more extensive renovation uh, of the Rupp Arena uh, Arts District around it. Uh, does the effort that you announced this week in any way represent some sort of uh, first phase of some projects that could be done along those lines. No, it really does not. I, you know, I, I, I won't speculate whether or not it would rekindle uh, the reinvent Rupp Arena initiative. There are still some needs with the Lexington F Center facilities, especially with respect to convention uh, space adequacy for the community to stay competitive uh, with other cities uh, against which we compete for conventions, but uh, the arena, this tech upgrade of the arena is first of all about preserving uh, our business model uh, for sponsorship and advertising and meeting the demands and needs of fans who expect to see video. You know, it, we were very late uh, getting video in Rupp Arena at all in 2001. Uh, now the building was, was uh, 25 years old at that point, but still. Uh, and that equipment is worn out and must be replaced in order for us to sustain the level where we are. How committed is Lexington Center to remaining the long-term home of the Kentucky Wildcats? Oh, I, I think very committed. I think that's, that's our, antici our anticipation and our desire. Uh, while we're upgrading and, and taking our worn out equipment and bringing it to a industry standard uh, in terms of the 16 by 9 and the high definition. Um, but it's also about uh, serving the needs of our concert uh, promoters and concert uh, patrons, uh, being able to continue these uh, large show um, productions. And while we're doing that, it makes it possible for us to install the center hung scoreboard. The other thing I might add is uh, we intend to replace our sports lighting uh, with an LED fixture, which is lighter, uh, which also is uh, far more uh, cost efficient in terms of electricity consumption. Um, and we also plan to do some uh, upgrades, well, not really an upgrade, but we, we uh, will be painting the red ducts uh, HVAC ducts and uh, painting the, the corner support towers, 
which back in the 1970s, you might remember Rep Arena opened and had orange seats and yellow seats right. and purple seats, and the color palette was all about, um, all about contrast, and the red colors that you still see in the ceiling were part of that. So we're going to re remove the last vestige <laughs> and go to a, to a more homogeneous uh, uh, appearance. <laughs> well, and uh, so as you say, uh, it'll continue to be a, a venue in, in your hopes for uh, not only concerts, but to stay at the home of the Wildcats. All right, you also manage uh, the Opera House. It's a grand building. Uh, just about a minute left. Is it being maintained as you oh, want it to be? Oh, absolutely. The Opera House, frankly, is one of our most utilized facilities. Uh, according to the uh, uh, to the uh, Association of Historic North American Theaters, it's one of only 14 theaters under a thousand seats built before 1900 that still functions as a theater. It's one of the smallest, if not the smallest, uh, theater in the country that hosts traveling Broadway productions. Uh, it is a terrific home for uh, local performing arts groups, the Philharmonic, the ballets, the uh, UK Opera. All of that comes with subsidy support from the Opera House Fund, uh, which for the last 40 years has uh, uh, continued to help us support programming at the Opera House. Uh, but it's in great shape. All right. Bill Owen, thank you so thank much you. for coming Delighted in. To be here. And it uh, will be interesting uh, to see the improvements at RUP. Thank you for joining us for WKYT's Kentucky Newsmakers. I'll see you bright and early this week on WKYT This Morning. We start at 4.30, and we hope you make it a good week ahead.